Uh, I started coding on Ethereum. Um, I won ETH Denver 2021 um, with my team. Uh, we built a anti-hack software and we ended up making that into a startup and into a company. So I left Duke to start that company, follow my you know, startup dream of college. So still living the dream, hope to keep living the dream. Um, we raised around four and a half million dollars from Dragonfly, Coinbase Ventures, OpenSea to build um, one of the top security tools out there for consumers right now. Um, but I won't really get into that during this presentation. It's mostly just going to be educational. And my claim to fame is that me and my brother, who's also my co-founder, debated Vitalik on stage at ETH Denver 2021, 22. I forget, but we were up there. That's our picture. Um, I post that everywhere. So um, let's just get into it. So for most people, security is a state of mind and not a state of being. So what does that really mean? Uh, when, when I talk about security and when security professionals talk about security, it's usually pretty discreet, it's measurable. Um, you'll go through a checklist and you'll see like, am I immune to this? Okay, check. Um, am I vulnerable to this? Okay, check. But for most people, that's not the way that we think about it. Uh, the way that we think about it is, you know, do I feel secure? Does the marketing language that the companies that are selling to me make me feel happy and wholesome? Um, do the pictures that they're using have smiling people that look secure? Um, and ultimately, you know, it's not a discrete measurement, it's more like a vibe check feeling that people have. So the goal of my presentation is to kind of, you know, break that dynamic, make security a more measurable and discrete thing for you, um, and essentially give you a quick, easy checklist of three points to say, am I secure or am I vulnerable? And just go from there. So I would say the biggest feeling when it comes to, you know, how secure am I? How am I feeling about security? Most people think, you know, I'm not going to be the next person to be attacked by a hacker, by a scammer. The protocols that I'm using aren't going to be the next ones that get attacked by um, high-funded hackers. Uh, essentially, it ain't gonna be me. And that kind of causes a lot of issues. That's a big reason why that whole kind of vibe check of do I feel secure versus am I actually secure comes from. That's where the kind of paradigm shift occurs. And I just wanna get into, you know, who are we kind of fighting against as end users? Who are the people that are actually trying to steal your crypto? Um, and I wanna paint them in a way that, that kind of visualizes the threat versus the stereotypes that we kind of see. So most people assume that crypto scammers and just scammers in general are just like in this weird call center um, or like in a sweatshop in the developing world. They're calling everybody, messaging everybody, making bots. Um, and to be honest with you, that couldn't be further from the truth. The truth is that the entire economy that causes wallets to be drained, protocols to be hacked, um, causes this over, I think over a trillion at this point, um, crypto theft issue is because of an economy that starts from the developed world with big bankrollers um, and moves across the world. How does that system work? Um, there's three pieces, just like any company. There's investors, there's managers, and then there's developers. So these bankrollers are spending hundreds of millions to tens of millions on projects um, where team leads are hiring developers to attack certain protocols, attack end users. Uh, so it's in their benefit to make themselves seem like this you know, call center in the developing world. But what they actually are are corporations built to steal your money. Uh, and the reason I kind of stress that point is because it, back to like the, the original point of security being this kind of mindset for most people instead of something concrete, this illusion that hackers are, are not educated, are not smart, are not good enough to take your money, that's a big reason why people feel secure but are not actually secure. So, moving from there. How, I, I guess like the big question is probably, how do you know if you're safe? There's a lot of conflicting security advice out there. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of panels or a lot of talks here talking about, you know, here are the top 10 security tips for, you know, MetaMask users or whatever. This is not going to be that kind of talk. I want to create a way to definitively measure your wallet security um, and actually, you know, give yourself an honest perspective. Like, am I secure or not? How can I be attacked? Where can I be attacked, et cetera. So here are the three categories. There's private key security, there's transaction security, and then there's action, uh, access management. 
And I'll be going a bit in depth on each of these. So just giving a quick summary, private key, how do you, steal your key, how do you store your keys, transactions, how open are you to phishing attacks, and access management, how many people have infinite access to your crypto, um, which is something that happens in crypto, so getting into it. For most people, the security journey stops at private keys, um, stops at hardware wallets. So the, and I, I respect these companies a lot, companies like Trezor, Ledger, KeepKey, um, but it's, it's, and I don't think their marketing is misleading in any way. I think customers are frequently misled to believe that a hardware wallet is the end all be all for their wallet security. And I think that's just uh, perpetuated by just kind of a community myth. Uh, in reality, private keys, I would say, are about, like, private key security is about 5 to 10% of an entire wallet security. So what is private key security? It's making sure that your, the access to your wallet, the master access to your wallet, is not stored on, like, Google Drive. I, I know there's some people in the audience right now that, that might be exposed right now, but Google Drive. Screenshots, I know screenshots are a big thing. The Notes app, uh, those are all really awful because those are stored in the cloud. Um, they, people might have access to it through other means other than, um, you know, a lot of other means. When you store your wallet and your recovery keys on paper or in a hardware wallet, um, it makes it a lot more harder to get that master access to your wallet. People would have to, you know, do the, the, the path of getting a private key from someone that owns a hardware wallet is a lot more difficult than other methods of theft. So as long as you have a private key, you should be, um, you know, that's kind of the first step, but it's not where your security journey should end. I would say the biggest, um, there's two biggest portions, and that's the transaction and access management portion. So for transactions, it's, the, the, the key idea is, am I protected against phishing attacks? If, if I was to click a link um, and believe that it was something else, what am I liable to lose all of my crypto assets? So there's services and browsers that, that protect you from phishing attacks. Um, you know, Google Chrome, there's other companies like us that, that help with this. But for the most part, um, transaction security is kind of the most vague. It's, it's really hard because uh, you, you're never gonna know from, so I, I guess I can illustrate this point with a story. Um, one of my best friends, um, he's a developer. He's been developing on crypto longer than me. He's an OG Bitcoin dev from around 2014, 2015. And he fell victim to an NFT mint scam, which is like, for most people, that's kind of like an elementary level scam. But just because he's exposed to it constantly, he's always on crypto Twitter, he's always on Telegram, um, just a hit rate of one caused him to lose all of a certain asset in his wallet. Um, so is there a way to be truly protected against all phishing attacks? I would say yes, it's a combination of both separating your assets across multiple wallets and also using tools that make sure that you're not signing anything that you're not supposed to be. I finally want to talk about access management. Uh, and the question here is, how many people have access to my crypto? How many, and when I talk about access to my crypto, it's, it's uh, a very strong term. And a lot of people don't realize that when you use a new app, like this, uh, this example image is talking about PancakeSwap, or if you're using Aave or OpenSea or, or any other marketplace or service, you are giving that company full access to all of that asset in your wallet. So that means that at any time, they can transfer the entire quantity of a certain token out of your wallet and into theirs. For the most part, a lot of companies use that power very safely. Um, Actually, I'll, I'll scratch that. Maybe about 25% of companies use that access very safely. 75% of them suck. Uh, they, they get audits that, that aren't useful. Um, and what happens is that when those smart contracts get hacked, when those protocols get hacked, all of the customers lose all of the money in their wallets. It's, it's awful. So when I talk about how many people have access to my crypto, um, reducing that amount is essential. And I want to talk about a specific case, and this is, this is something that really was popular um, last year, but it's still continuing now. If you guys have heard of the monkey drainer hack, um, this, is, this is similar. So gasless NFT theft, what does that mean? It means that people are losing all of the NFTs, all of the tokens in their wallet without even sending a transaction to the blockchain. And the question is, you know, 
how does that happen? Why, why are people losing money without even sending a transaction to the blockchain? And it's because um, NFT marketplaces like X2Y2, OpenSea, Blur, what they're doing is they have full access to your tokens, of course, because they're letting you buy and sell tokens. But there's this weird feature on these exchanges that lets you sign a signature, like a login signature if you're familiar. If you've ever used the Web3 protocol, it's like that gasless signature. By using a gasless signature, you can sell all of your assets to another person in a private auction for zero ETH. Meaning that if you sign that, if you sign that gasless signature, you've just given somebody else access to your entire wallet balance for zero ETH. They can buy it off of OpenSea or they can buy it off of X2Y2. This is one thing that gets solved super easily by just revoking that NFT marketplace access to your assets. So um, what, we, what I've done for a lot of people is I kind of go through their wallet and see you know, what protocols have access to your crypto. And if you've been using crypto since like 2017, 2018, it's probably around 50 to 75 protocols have access to your tokens. If any of those guys get hacked, you're done. You're, you're losing all of your money. Um, so I would say that when it comes to the ranking of importance of actual security in crypto, I would rate hardware wallets and just like private key security at the bottom. And when it comes to scams and access, um, access management, I would put those on top. Um, and I just want to go into kind of, you know, the, the logic of an attacker and why these routes are, are the most like lucrative. So if, if I'm a hacker and I'm trying to steal people's money, I'm not going to, it, it's the hardest route for me to try to steal someone's private key. At this point, people know not to put their private key in like a website or anything like that. It's way easier for me to just get you to sign a gasless signature on, on uh, some NFT marketplace and sell all your assets to me. It's so easy and it's mass producible. And that's why these last two points of kind of um, transaction security and action ac access management are the most important to me. So um, I guess when it comes to actually solving those problems, just going back to my slides, for private keys, get a hardware wallet. Even though I kind of talk trash about them, I have one. I have every wallet that I have is a hardware wallet. You need one. Even if it's 10%, you need one. And get your private keys off of your notes app, please. And if you actually did put your notes app private key, maybe make a new wallet. Uh, for transaction security, make sure that it, it, do, it doesn't matter what service you use to um, prevent phishing, um, but your eye is not the only one. Like, your eye is not trained enough to track every single phishing scam out there. So please just use a service that's out there. There's plenty of them. And finally, access management. Make sure that you're revoking your approvals as soon as you put them in. Um, there's a cool website called revoke.cash. I should have put the logo in my, in my slides. Um, you put your address in, and you can just remove all access from every company, uh, all companies' access to your crypto. So I guess that's kind of the end of my presentation. I know I, I talk kind of fast. I want to leave the floor open to any questions. Um, I don't want to hammer on these points too hard. Yeah, go ahead. So the question was, um, so there's a new kind of paradigm in wallets where they're giving you the ability to define how much of a certain asset you're giving to a certain protocol. So for example, I have, uh, well, I wish I had 100,000 USDC, but imagine I had 100,000 USDC. Um, and then I gave Uniswap access to 10,000. That means that they're only able to access 10,000 and the rest of it, and once that 10,000 is kind of used up, they don't have access anymore. It's more common, but it's not, it's getting more common, but I would say it's like a 10% thing. Um, and I would say even then, even if all of your approvals are limited, uh, there's specific edge cases that cause these um, approvals to kind of linger. And that's with NFTs. NFTs, they're never gonna ask you to approve each NFT individually. When you use an NFT marketplace or when you're trading NFTs, you are giving access to every NFT you own 
or ever will own of that specific type to a company. And they're never going to ask you to do it one by one because it's an awful UX process. So I would still recommend going through and you know, revoking those approvals because not every one of them can be limited. Cool. And I guess uh, with that, uh, any more questions? Oh, go ahead. One Cosmos? We're expanding to layer twos and the side chains um, in Q2. So um, I, I know we didn't talk about it right now, but um, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders at Harpy. We stop people from sending money to scammers and fishers by essentially sitting between their wallet and the blockchain. The question is, well, right now we work on Ethereum. The question is when Cosmos, Cosmos Q2. So March, um, anywhere from April to, April to June. I think delegates are super important. So, the, so for people that are not aware about, uh, so the question is what do I think about delegates? And for people that are not aware about delegates, um, it's kind of like a way to prove your ownership of a certain asset without actually connecting the wallet that owns the asset into a certain protocol or anything like that. It's just kind of a degree of separation. I would say anything that separates um, your assets, like fragmentizes your assets between different wallets or different paradigms is important. Um, personally, uh, when it comes to my own crypto security, I have my assets split between many different wallets. Um, I have my own security system there. Uh, when it comes to your personal security, I would just recommend having a threshold. I don't know what's comfortable for you. Maybe it's 1,000, maybe it's 50,000, but whatever you're comfortable to lose on each wallet, which is hopefully zero, but um, as long as you're not losing your entire balance for making one mistake, um, I support anything of that kind of type. So I love delegates. I love delegate cash, who's kind of the lead of that, um, who's kind of leading that initiative. Um, and I, I hope to see more of them, to be honest with you. So the question was, how do you, how do, I, I guess, how do we protect, like, as a company or just in general? Okay, cool. So the question is, how do companies defend against like supply chain issues like Ledger's Connect Kit and stuff like that? Um, and the truth is that there's, when it comes to like hardware wallets, that's a big trust factor when you're using them uh, because there's nowhere really, there's nowhere else really in the whole like crypto supply chain except you know hardware wallets and the portals that you use. Also like software wallets like MetaMask. Um, you know, I would say. It's a tough question because those are like the most dangerous attacks. And at, for like a hacker team, it, it's super profitable. The, the prospect of hacking MetaMask or the prospect of hacking Ledger, like ConnectKit, um, is, is a super profitable idea. And it's something that's going to happen. Um, and my recommendation there is I hope nothing like that ever happens because it's going to be bad for, I would say, a majority of crypto users. Um, or any, I don't think the ConnectKit issue was at the scale of like, apocalyptic levels, but if there is ever a threat like that, I would just make sure that your assets are separated across multiple wallets. Do, do you mind if I come over there? Uh, I, I can't hear you too well. Awesome, okay. So last question, the, the, the question is, you know, I talked about hardware wallets and how we're supposed, to, like how it's important to have one, but I didn't talk about where we're storing the recovery keys. So for context, that's like the paper and pencil where you store your seed phrase. Uh, honestly, there's not really many good ways to do so. Like I've seen people engrave it on metal so it doesn't like burn if your house burns down. Um, I, I, I think the best way and the most used way is writing it down on a piece of paper and storing it um, in, in a place that only you know about. Uh, I wouldn't actually store your seed phrases in a bank security deposit box because it's, it's actually dangerous. People get hacked that way. So I would say storing it in a place that only you know, maybe that's digging a hole, maybe that's in a cabinet, but um, just put it on paper and never digitally. 
Uh, and that was the last question, so uh, sorry about that. You can meet me over there, and we can talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thanks so much, and have a good one. for that. Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me good? Good? Okay. All right. All right. Okay, so we're going to move on to our uh, first panel of the day. We're going to move on to our first panel of the day. There we go. Uh, this is uh, ETH Denver 2024, hashtag ETH Denver 2024. <laughs> Please uh, post on socials um, anything that you like. Uh, Remember, there are two main venues here. Uh, there's, this is the Sport Castle. We also have the Biddle Hub. There are three stages in each. There are speakers from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day. So there's a lot of content for you to get out and listen to. Every stage is streaming on Twitch. So if you are not able to be somewhere, you can watch everything via Twitch. Uh, while you're here today and tomorrow or the last days, your Biddle Bucks are worth two for one. So go to the swag table and uh, get some official swag. You can also visit while you're here. There is an art gallery. We have a blockchain arcade. There's a career hub for the first time this year, Saturday, 10 uh, a.m. to 3 p.m. There's childcare. There's uh, the Zen Zone. I have a, an exhibit in the Zen Zone, so go check it out. There's a makerspace, a podcast studio that you can uh, book, and tabletop gaming arena. So if you're tired of listening to people talk, go have fun in any one of those additional places. So for this panel, we uh, are going to be talking about user experience in Web3, or how to build things for real people. <laughs> uh, Shannon is going to be our moderator. She is a SporkDAO board member. We're going to have Greg Bresnitz, the CEO of FWB. We're going to have Kelvin Chang, who is a product manager for Coinbase, and another volunteer here at East Denver, and Francisco Pinto, the protocol lead from Request Network. So let's give it up. Thanks, guys. Welcome to day one. Hey, gentlemen. I hope everybody's having a good ETH Denver so far. I like the side of it. <laughs> so uh, this is a little bit of a change of pace from the security talk that we just had. We're going to bring it back down to like kind of the, the core level of like why are we for. Uh, so the thinking behind this panel is that for the a bit of that we hello yeah the original message is that we really wanted to build tech solutions and we were talking about banking the unbanked and we wanted to you know like create freedom and transparency. And we've gotten stuck in this really interesting hamster wheel of all sorts of L1s, all sorts of dev tooling, and we still haven't solved things like remittances and the things that we kind of talked about to you know, like start this whole um, space off. So today we've got a really interesting group of people coming at it from different aspects to talk about what should the user experience be, what, like what are we really building for here, and we've got some different takes on it. So Francisco, you want to kick us off and just give us some high level of like what you've been building and what you think about this? Yeah, sure. So Request Network, I, I would say it's like a hybrid between the other companies here, which Coinbase, which is a bit more centralized, and FWB, which is fully decentralized. Um, so Request Network is a, is a protocol that allows you to add data to your blockchain transactions. And we do that by storing this data uh, in a decentralized way, so on IPFS and dash it back on chain. I'm not going to get into the details of it. But allows you to create uh, somewhat of uh, decentralized invoices and receipts for blockchain payments, which allows uh, the fina financial industry and companies from tr the traditional finance to come inside uh, the Web3 space and allows them to have their accounts managed in a more correct way and be more compliant. Um, that's basically what we've been building on Request Network. And there's a plot twist, so we'll come back to that. But Greg, what are you building? 
Uh, I oversee a DAO called Friends with Benefits, or FWB. Shout out to the members in the audience. Uh, we are the largest uh, Web3 social network, and our mission is super simple. We use culture to drive the adoption of emerging tech. So excited to chat about that today. And Kelvin? Hi, everyone. Oh. Hi, everyone. My name is Hey everyone, uh, name is Kelvin, like the temperature. Uh, nice to meet you guys. So I work for Coinbase, specifically right now I'm on the institutional USDC team, but I used to work on Coinbase Wallet. So uh, really happy to be here to chat about you know, high level, what we're thinking when we think about user experience and, and things like that. So the thinking and bringing uh, traditional finance, the nexus with culture and Web3, and a platform that has onboarded more Americans than arguably any other, is to really come at it from a different perspective. And I had a great debate with a community member, Deacon, the other day about, do we actually need to build Web3 tooling for the rest of the world and, and kind of obfuscate the Web3 part of it? And his argument was that, no, this tech matters as it is. We don't need to build Web 2.5 and hide it behind the curtain. Like, people should want to come here. They should want to opt in and use these tools, and there's a learning curve for that. My argument was different, but I would love to get your take on it. I mean, the answer is no. I think that this is a really concentrated audience of people, but the space is almost saturated for this room. Like, I think... You know, you might choose a different L1 or you might move to an L2 or an easier, but I think it's the benefits of the technology that people actually care about, but it has to maybe be 10% harder than current technology, but 12% is going to have a steep cliff and steep fall off. So most people like it, but it's too, too much for them. So I disagree for any, it depends who you're talking to. To this audience, yes, they care about. To anyone outside of it, it needs to be way easier and way simpler for people to also have the benefits but then integrate it into their daily lives. I think I have a... Disagree. <laughs> I have a different view. I think that uh, this, maintaining the value is important, but Web3 will not grow if we don't build the right tooling around it so that provides a good user experience and that abstracts most of the Web3 components. So account abstracting is a thing because regular people, per se, don't want to deal with wallets, seed phrases, stuff like that. Uh, they don't want to have to sign things when they, they are using a website. So I do think that the, the, the goal here, and it's a, it's a very difficult road because you have to kind of uh, manage how to incorporate the values of Web3 that are really important, the decentraliz decentralization, transparency, even efficiency, because Web3 is very efficient in, in, in some points that Web2 is not, um, into a good user experience, and you'll end up having these tools built, but uh, with users not knowing that they are using Web3, not knowing what's really behind the scenes, like in every other tech that we use. Um, but in the long term, taking the benefit of using the, the Web3 uh, technology behind it, yeah. I think I have a blended view of the two. Um, when we think about you know, onboarding the next billion people, there's no doubt going to be people who don't know how to use the tech as well as everyone else. Um, I don't want to pick on my mom, but for example, my mom, I tried to teach her how to use uh, a self-custodial wallet, and she's confused. I think she probably have the app deleted at this point, um, but she was confused. She didn't really know how to do it, and there would be no hope trying to teach her how to use like DeFi protocols and, and things like that, at least at the current moment. Um, and we want that technology to get to a point where every single human in the world is using Web3 versions of things, or, or the Web3, be onboarded into the Web3 world. But I think it does take a lot of familiarity uh, and baby steps, uh, maybe you know, Web 2.5, before we can get to a place where every single human in the world is comfortable being on chain, being in the Web3 world. 
Well, and to that, I think it's kind of a yes and, right? Like maybe we do have these deep layers here and we come together and we nerd out and your mom has something that she doesn't have to worry about it with. And my argument with Deacon was that, you know, as Marshall McLuhan said, we shape our tools, but our tools shape us as well. And when you think about the cell phone in your hand and how much that has changed the way that you communicate with people, if we can get transparent and honest tech in the hands of people, what is that going to start doing? Thinking about who is my neighbor? Who do I share value with? Does it have to go through a gatekeeper like Visa? Or can I interact with you guys directly? And how does that change your ideas of community? So uh, I'd like to like, shift it a little bit to talk about some of the stuff that's happening with FWB and the cultural side. Because you guys are building you know, for a broader audience. But FWB works with people who are right brainers. Like This is a harder thing to build, something that's sticky when we're talking about like, getting out of Discord. And what have you experienced? And what's some of the feedback on Web3 Tech that you get? I mean, I think where we really win is where we take whatever. I mean, there's like 400 vendors here. I mean, if you can't see it, it's like endless seas of people. These are just tools. These are like, and I, I would say that like to your point, I think we've reached a point where we have great hammers, we have great cement, we have great wiring, but what are we using it for? Like what is the actual point of any of this of any of this stuff here? And the ones that win are culture. I'm looking at base behind us. Base hunt is a arguably a, a home run because it married really easy tech with the wallet with culture and you're gonna see people doing it. So I think for us where we see wins or where we're actually most interested in is the people that want to take the great tooling they did and then actually run it through a cultural lens for adoption. That's the only place that I think growth is actually going to happen. I don't think if, if the financialization of everything was going to bring everyone to the space, we'd have way more people. Your mom would be a D-Gen. It'd be awesome. <laughs> but I think it's only within culture that we're going to see that big adoption. And so that's the area that we like to play in. And that's where we see the, the best results. Kelvin, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think I think I agree with, with everything here. Um, I, I think you know when we think about Web three, it, it is a next generation of the internet, right? Like we want everyone to be there one day. So yeah, I agree with you, everything you say. Um, you know, I, I think what you guys are building is also really amazing. You want your mom to be a DJ? <laughs> I, I it would be nice if she tells me you know that's uh, like this new thing, like check this out, and and not me telling her all the time. I think it is nice if we can have our roles reversed once in a while. Well, and Francisco, the plot twist on what's going on with Request Network is that you guys have really started focusing on developing economies. So talk to us about going from, you know, kind of an invoicing platform to helping bank the unbanked. Yeah, so Request Network is, is deep on the financial side, but uh, it's, deep, it's deep on the decentralized finance. And um, we want to try to create something that's very inclusive uh, and decentralized on, uh, and efficient. But... Uh, that allows um, the, the 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 everyone to to join and to make like uh, get access to these tools that uh, right now are more difficult to get access to. You need, I mean, there's like two three million unbanked in the world, right? And with crypto being a, a, um, a bank account in your pocket, this this is possible. Uh, the thing is, you need to convince the, these financial institutions or create new financial institutions on top of the chain. And that's what we are about. We are trying to create the, the data layer that will allow to have financial context that's owned by you, it's decentralized, um, and that people can build on top of the new, the new finance of the future. We believe at request that the financial system will be on chain, and we are trying to create the tools to make that happen faster. Well, and I'm curious, so you guys are just as much a part of this as we are. Who here thinks, keep Web3, Web3, and you have to like come join us here? Raise your hand. I like it, hot take. Who here says we need to make this way easier and obfuscate it in the background? People who can't see, it's everyone. <laughs> and I, can I just say for your yeah. story, like the unbanked is such a massive story for Web3, but I think that the way that you tell that story is through culture. I think that it's very hard to tell people just like to get them to care straight, straight forward about unbanked. I think you need to make something way more compelling about how this opens up, why this space opens us up. And I, again, I, I'm going to just say it a million times. It's through the cultural way of that type of narrative and storytelling that's going to get people to care. 
It's explain not going to just be like it's an untapped audience. Explain what you mean by culture. What's that? Uh-huh. Double click on culture. What do you mean? I just mean like if I were to think about the way that I would tell that story, it wouldn't be like going to be like here's an audience that you know we can have access to that you know is an untapped audience. I would tell the story of what does it mean to be unbanked? What resources are not yeah. given to you? Like what does it mean to be a refugee or to not have access to things that we all take for granted? and tell that story in a way that's like very compelling, almost like traditional marketing. And then the solve for that is actually Web3 because you win them with emotion, not with just like a, a straightforward pitch. Definitely, uh, maybe I passed myself wrong, but definitely it wasn't my point to, see, to tell this as a, a segment of the market that we are targeting because we are not. We are actually just building, we are open source, we just build infrastructure and our goal is to build infrastructure that will allow these people not to be unbanked because products will be built on top. But the unbanked is a part of it. We, we believe that finance should be more inclusive, it should be more decentralized. So bringing, bringing these financial institutions on top of the chain by showing them the, 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 the improved efficiency that they can get, it will open up the this, the system itself, they will become more, more decentralized by coming on top of the chain. They will become more transparent and they will become more in- inclusive. So my point is, uh, in order, I believe that in order to bring, make this happen, there needs to be incentives for, for, uh, for the, the players that are building things to come in and to do things. Because I'm not saying culture is not important, but culture, it's not a motivation enough, unfortunately. I strongly disagree. <laughs> I, I think I really like the, the point about culture um, and specifically thinking about a lot of the technologies and apps we use these days, you likely heard it from your friends and family first, and that's why you, you went and downloaded it. May it be you know, social media apps or, or a certain phone or like, you know, things like that. I think that's one thing that's that's missing a little bit in the in the web3 space that that kind of element of delight that makes people want to go hey like friends like show like check this out um, like this is amazing this changes lives like get this app or, or get this you know protocol whatever um, right now I think we're missing that element there's a lot of projects and, and things within the, the web3 space where it's like a technical delight where if you understand the technology behind it, you'll be amazed by it. But um, they're not necessarily more of like the common you know, delight that I think people are used to with Web 2, you know, picking up maybe an iPhone for the first time and thinking, oh, wow, this just works you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, I, think, I think a lot of that element is, is missing with Web 3. And I think we're, we're slowly getting there. And there's a lot of very exciting technology that's going to make the, the general public um, excited to share things with their friends and family and their groups. And, and yeah. Tell us why. Why is it missing? Is it because UX and Web3 is just really hard? Is it because we're missing something? We're not thinking about it right? We're still kind of in our own little echo chamber and we're okay with it? Are we missing dApps? Like, why? I I do think in certain areas, the the UX still has a lot of improvements. But I also think that fundamentally being onboarded onto Web3 is kind of a a change in mindset. For example, just to to think about self-custodial wallet, for example, it's not what you're used to when you think about, you know, I have a Gmail account and I can use this Gmail account everywhere to make an account on all the different Web3, sorry, Web2 platforms. I don't think, it's not exactly the same idea with like a wallet. And I think in wallets, there's like multiple different accounts in the wallet. Like there's, it's a lot of, twisting the way you're thinking about how you interact with the space and you don't you know you don't download an app you you most likely be going to a specific dapp and then just like integrating your your uh um, wallet with it so it's like a a a change in mindset that isn't easy and i think someone mentioned like a a a growth curve you know you have to learn how to do it before you're you're web3 proficient and and web3 native and i think that transition can definitely be smoother with better ux um, and I think, again, back to the baby step points, like we need baby steps to get people comfortable to be a fully on-chain kind of person. Um, yeah, L- love to hear everyone's thought. I-, I feel like there's maybe some disagreement here. Um, yeah, I do, I do think there are the, there is still a problem with the UX on Web3. And the problem is, one of the biggest problems is that right now, if you want to keep things uh, 
easy to use, you need to kind of abdicate a, a bit of decentralization. And I think that we can improve that. We can keep things decentralized with good uh, user experience. Another thing is that Web3 is very specific and it's very spe it has very specific things that are not normal for a uh, traditional user. Uh, the wallet, as you mentioned, is something that's hard to, to uh, get by. And the transactions, right, they, 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 it takes time. You see, when you use a Web3 product, you can see that it takes time. And, and what happens on the blockchain needs to be very transparent for the user, right? You need to have all these messaging saying your transaction is being processed. Um, you need to be able to confirm when that happens uh, or try to explain at all the steps that you are making to make the user secure, right? Because the user knows that when, uh, when you go to a new app on Web3, even if you are experienced, you always think, uh, am I going to connect my wallet here? Am I going to click on this button to run this transaction? So it's important for you to, on the user experience side, to show what is happening on your product, because that brings a lot of trust. And, and the, these little details will matter when, uh, when, uh, and will be improved in the, in, the, in the times to come. I think we're just still stuck in talking about tools. I, don't, I mean, when I asked Shannon what the purpose of this was, you were like, it's three, four years on, and we still haven't built like, a killer consumer app, I think. Warpcast is probably the closest that any of us, and there's a reason why people are so excited about it, because it feels the closest to uh, anything else in the real world, but we're just talking about like identity or wallets. Like We're not actually talking about the things that are supposed to sit on top of that that captures people like hearts and minds and imagination. So until we can just talk about those products, we're going to be stuck in people feeling joyless about a lot of this stuff. Totally. OK, final question. You have a magic wand. What one thing in Web3 would you improve, shift, fix? Yeah. <laughs> I can um, kick us off if you're not ready. Um, a just a second. So to improve, I would say user experience is the main thing to improve. But, but say one thing. like. We now one have thing, things one that specific we love. Thing, or, mm -hmm. Account abstraction. I would say fast forward us five years to where we're having a ton of consumer products and seeing what the world looks like, living on top of Web3 Rails. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm not going to talk about specific product. But I think I, I hope that we can get to a place where when I talk to people about crypto, their first reaction is not just, oh, prices, or I want to make money in X, Y, Z, but it's like, oh, yeah, I use this really cool thing that changed my life, this tool um, you know, that's, that's built on top of Web3 technology that really improved my, my living qualities and things like that. So I think hoping we can get to that place one day is, is something that I think would be great. Yeah. I, thank you for that. And, and mine is that people would recognize that we have options, right? Like, Speaking for Americans right now, we feel like we're stuck in a, a political system with no options. We've been stuck in a financial system. A lot of us act like inflation is the weather and then we can't change it, it just is. I would love for people to know, maybe this is too complex, maybe it's too speculative. You don't have to opt in, but you do have a choice. There's somewhere else to go. So with that, we will say thank you very much, guys. Enjoy your Thanks. East Denver. We'll see you soon.
Okay, everybody, that was a great panel, uh, if you listened to it, about building real-world products. And we're going to move on to our next topic, which is ZK by Alio. So we have uh, John Reynolds from Alio, and he is the co-founder of ZPass. He's going to be talking about building ZK products that solve real-world problems. So this is a stage all about the actual world <laughs> and how we put these products um, into practice for everyday people and problems. Uh, just as a quick reminder, we do have a water bottle filling station right over here. We have restrooms this way. Uh, remember, there are three stages in each of our buildings. You can uh, search the East Denver schedule for any of the talks at any of those six stages. Um, there's the Zen Zone upstairs in childcare. There's the arcade. So there's a lot of fun things to do. There's an art gallery. Uh, make sure you enjoy not only what you're hearing here on the different stages, but all that East Denver has to offer. It's a gorgeous day outside. Hopefully you get some sunshine also. And with that, let's bring up John. Thank you. All righty, thank you everyone. It's funny because she said, you know, the title initially that I proposed was building ZK products to solve real world problems and our marketing team got a hand on it and it turned into building the antidote to the identity theft virus. Um, so this is where we're at now. So to kick things off, to, to start with a really a startling statistic, 86% of consumers worldwide have been the victim of some form of identity fraud. It's estimated nearly $50 billion a year is lost as a result of identity fraud, and $28 billion of that is tied directly to identity fraud as a result of some form of data breach. One of the ways that was just recently described as to how a lot of individuals feel about their user data on the web is hopeless. Uh, they don't have a lot of hope in being able to have their information secured, and they don't have a lot of hope in being able to have these platforms very motivated to secure their information. And so what we've seen week after week is these headlines from big tech companies that have been leaking user information or user information has been exposed in. And it's as a result of this centralized and client server model that we've all gotten very used to. I, I think it's clear and obvious to say we are all very well aware that we have a problem. And it, it, it's a very big problem, and it goes back all the way to the beginning of the internet, where we didn't have a unified identity system. We also didn't have encryption at that time. And a lot of these paradigms have continued to exist and actually foster a benefit for these platforms and these big tech companies. And as a result of not having these identity systems, a lot of these different companies leaned into developing or building their own authentication systems. And this led to a patchwork of ad hoc identity systems across the web, none of them solving each other's problems, but solving at least the problem that they were having, which was understanding or acknowledging who their customer was and how they could interact with a specific user and have knowledge of their identity or their information. So naturally, when you have a problem, it, it, it's an instinct to think, well, why hasn't this problem be, been solved yet? Why is it that we're forced into this paradigm where we have to share a lot of our user information with platforms and big tech companies? And I think there's two distinct pathways or positions or perspectives that you can have on this. Well, sure, surely there's more, but the two main ones, the two main angles that I think are worth focusing on is the first being incentives are not aligned. So a lot of these platforms have benefited immensely from this dynamic where their users' activity is a bit more transparent. They have visibility into the user's behaviors so they can personalize features, so they can create marketing strategies or business strategies that are targeting specific things as a result of this information that they're able to gather. The second angle I think that you can take on why this hasn't been solved is it's a very hard problem. So identity spans a variety of different contexts, and depending on the industry that you're in, whether it be TradFi or whether it be a social media, the amount of information that the platform needs to know is very different. 
and the context changed not only the amount of information, but the level of validation that these platforms need behind that information. So this is a really challenging thing to solve. And we've seen some attempts on it. If we are just thinking about identity in the realm and in, in the landscape of login, we've seen some real attempts in trying to make this more efficient to improve the user convenience and to make it overall better and safer for the user. And one of these ways is SSO, so single sign-on. And what this allowed is it allowed a user to take their credentials from one platform and use them in another platform. And so we started to reduce the amount of custom authentication systems that we were seeing grow across the web that continued to fragment user information and increase the dispersion of user information across the web. So this was good. This was a good step forward. The only downside of this approach is that, as you can see from looking at the diagram, it kept us in a very centralized and dependent-based uh, paradigm or relationship. All of the nodes in these diagrams, you can see, rely on the center node, the centralized entity, to provide their information. And so even though we may have had a bit more convenience and interoperability with our information, we were still in a client-server paradigm where we were forced, and we continue to be forced, in exchange for access to have to give up our information. And so a server requests information, and a user provides that, and the server verifies or processes and verifies and stores some of that information, and then the user is given access. And this is the cost of accessing platforms and services now on the web. We share information, we are the product, and they gain from that in some capacity, and oftentimes, unfortunately, our information gets leaked. And I don't believe in some cases that platforms are as motivated as they should be in protecting that user information. But ultimately, the architecture of our system comes to blame. So this is where ZPass comes in. And, and ZPass is an identity solution that is built on top of Alio. Alio is a layer one blockchain that integrates zero knowledge proofs into the transactions. And it has a ledger that is encrypted. So unlike Ethereum, when you go on to uh, an explorer on Alio, you can't see the information related to all of the transactions unless you are the owner of a private key that executed that transaction. So users who are interacting with Alio's blockchain are able to decrypt the specific interactions that they're making with the blockchain, but users that do not have the private key or are not able to or are not interacting, they're not able to decrypt other people's transactions. So what ZPass is trying to do is it's trying to exist as an identity solution leveraging zero knowledge proofs in the blockchain to give users more control of their information but also to flip us into a prover and verifier paradigm, where instead of, as users, being forced to provide our personal information with servers, we generate a proof around some information, and then we provide the proof to the server, which verifies it and then grants access to that particular service. So to provide a, a visual of what this means or what this can look and feel like, ZPass allows users to shift from this dynamic where all of their information on their ID has to be shared in order to, for example, prove their age. In this case, if you go to a bar and you want to buy alcohol, you present your ID, and a lot more information is shared with the bartender or the cashier than is necessary. The cashier actually doesn't want to know all of that information either, to be frank. But all of this is shared when in reality, they only need to know the date of birth. And, and it, it goes even further than this, and this is one of the great things about zero knowledge technology is it allows you to create proofs, cryptographic proofs that can be proven to meet some certain outcome or prove that some statement is true without having to reveal the underlying information. And so instead of even having to expose your date of birth, we can go a step f further and only show the predicate, which is to say, instead of a user having to give up their date of birth, they just have to provide a proof that will tell the platform that they're over the age of 21. And we've seen a lot of regulation um, and, and compliance realities starting to push forward in the identity space. And with different uh, individuals of different age groups and uh, different interests interacting online, 
we believe that ZPass is going to be a great solution to provide users more flexibility in how their information is used and how it's shared with platforms and the amount of information that is used and shared. So like I mentioned, this moves us away from a client server paradigm where, paradigm where plain text information is getting sent to a server and it shifts us to a prove or verify par paradigm where users are in control of their information Servers are requesting proof of particular criteria. The user generates that proof from their information, and that gets shared with the server, which verifies it. In this instance, the server gets a general amount of information based on the criteria that they've set as required, and the user gets to uh, reduce the amount of personal information they're having to share. So there's the same security and verification guarantees for the platform except the user's information is secured and private during this interaction. And this allows us to shift even a step further forward from the federated approach. It eliminates that central dependency on some third party or central service, and it allows users to be the owners of their information and then produce the proofs and share it under their own free will and their own circumstances. This means that platforms are interacting directly with users for their information, and they're also reducing the amount of information they're getting exposed to. And while I said at the beginning there's certainly interests from platforms in gaining this visibility and transparency into their users, and so there has been some resistance to moving towards more private protocols, with a lot of the regulations that are getting pushed forward today and a lot of the understanding improving around some of these risks as it relates to privacy and security, a lot more platforms are starting to recognize that they actually want to reduce their liability in having to secure and manage all of this user information. And if there's a way that they can reduce it to a statistic where, hey, we had X number of users over 21 or within some grouping, that's actually going to allow, it's going to equip them with opportunities to market and strategize, but it's going to also prevent them from as many liabilities in the long run. So going back to Alio quickly, um, speaking about Alio as a, a ZK layer one blockchain, the way that Alio works is it has a set of programs that exist on chain in a program registry. So you can think of this very similarly to a smart contract. And what happens is the actual execution of programs occurs off-chain. And the reason that it's able to do that is because a zero-knowledge proof is generated in the process of the program being executed. So this means we can move the entire computational expense of program execution into an off-chain capacity, generate the proof, have the proof sent back in a transaction to the blockchain, and then have a validator node receive that proof, verify it, and then update the state of the blockchain. This gives users the ability to, on their local device, execute functions using their own personal data and information with an air gap from the internet. So the user has some form of digital credentials or ID, and they need to prove something from that to some platform. They're able to execute a program and a function locally on their machine, produce the proof, and then wrap that in a transaction that is either sent back to the blockchain and finalized on chain, or even sent to a third party that is able to just find or that is able to just verify the proof on their own. So for ZPass, again, the process is creating a ZPass, which is creating, uh, taking a digital credential or creating a new cred uh, digital credential and introducing it on chain, you execute a function that will uh, validate that credential to produce a ZPass. Then you use a ZPass to generate proofs around your information and that proof is shared. To look at this in a little bit more depth, so like I mentioned, you can either issue a ZPass and we have an SDK library that we've built out to allow users to very easily leverage specific signature schemes and then the Alio library for, develop or for generating proofs. But the other option is you can actually take a physical passport or physical credential and introduce that as a ZPass. And the way that that is done is uh, passports are actually cryptographically signed, so you can extract the information via an NFC chip and you can take the attributes from the passport, you can take the public key of the uh, signing authority or the issuing authority, and you can take the signature from it. And you can verify all of the attributes were issued by 
some particular authority through a signature verification. And if this signature verification passes, this means we can trust that the information about the user from the passport is legitimate. And so we take that information and we put it into a record, and that's coupled with a proof, saying that this information that we are showing in this record came from a passport, and we verified the signature of that passport. The next step is generating the proof. So like I said, programs on chain have functions, and those functions can be executed off chain, locally on the user's machine. So we have a ZPass, which is a record, and it ha you can think of it as a data object. It has the user's passport information in it. And then you have a function, some sort of claim verification, like checking that the user is over the age of 21. And then the result is a proof. If the user passes this claim verification, we, we generate a proof, which can ultimately be provided to a network so it exists on chain, or it can be provided to a platform off chain who just has to verify this zero knowledge proof to attest to the fact that the user is over some particular age or even maybe not of some particular nationality if we're thinking of a uh, more traditional finance route where they're, they're trying to avoid working with customers um, from OFAC sanctioned country. I break this down a little bit more just to help uh, everyone understand some of the different components of this process because it's, it's, it's important to realize how this can really change the paradigm of how we're interacting with individuals on the web. So the idea is in the issuance process, you have a credential with a set of attributes and a signature. This might look like an owner, a date of birth, some nationality, and an expiration. In creating a Z pass, if you're issuing it, we go through a process to reduce the amount of data that exists on chain or plain text data. Even though it is encrypted, we want to get to a place where we can reduce that as much as possible. So we use a Merkle tree approach to produce a series of leaf hashes and then ultimately a root hash that gets signed by some issuing authority and placed into a record that lives on chain. So once that gets presented and the signature is verified from that credential, we're able to go into the process of generating a record, which is a ZPass, and that proof that I mentioned earlier. From here, we have the ability to create proofs now from that record that lives on chain without ever having to expose the underlying data of the user or the user's information. The ZPass record by the user can get presented to a series of verifications. The ones I've mentioned here is over the age of 18, a US citizen, and that the credential is not expired. If the data in the record is able to attest to these different values and the user passes these verifications, then the next step is generating a proof in the result, true or false, if the user passed. So if they've passed all of these verifications, and the final step is to produce the proof, and if the, they've passed, again, the, the result would be true, and the proof will attest to the fact that the user presented a valid ID with a valid signature that met these different parameters. So that is um, everything from my side. I hope everyone enjoyed. I hope that gave you some more perspective and understanding into how zero-knowledge proofs can push us from a client server architecture to a prover verifier architecture that allows us to not only protect our user information, but also gives platforms a way to avoid some of the liability and risks of having to secure and maintain and manage user information. Um, if you have any interest in looking into the solution a little bit more, you can check out zpass.alio.org. Um, we also have a demo on the website that you can step through to see what this might look and feel like. Uh, we also, if you visit zpass.tools.alio.org, we have a demo of the SDK and some of the different features that you can leverage off-chain and in an on-chain capacity. So thank you so much, everyone, for the time, and I hope everyone has a great day.
Okay, welcome back everybody, thank you. If there are any SHIFI members in the audience, if there are any SHIFI members not in the audience but within this area that can hear my voice, I want you to come to the choral stage. We're gonna have a rock star SHIFIer, Mira Tumlos here. She's gonna be talking about staking. Mira works uh, for Diva Staking and this talk is decentralized staking for the future of Ethereum. This is the infrastructure and scalability track. This is the track that makes us reach that first million, let alone our second million. So please, let's give it up for Mira. Oh, hello? I'm just waiting for my screen to come up. Yes. Awesome. Sorry, just waiting for my screen to come on. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Camera two, what's up? Oh, hey. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. I'm actually going to talk a little bit fast, but I hear you're all used to that. So let's go. Um, hello, everyone. It's nice to meet you and really great to be back here in the great state of Colorado. We're here live and obviously in person. And the energy in here is honestly insane. I said it was great in my speech, but it's kind of insane. Some of us are here meeting our teams for the first time out here, right in the front row. Um, some are gathering together once for a, only a few times that they do per year. And some people are here, here actually to find a new team. So if anyone hasn't said it yet, I want to welcome you all to my stage today. So my name is Myra Tumlos, and I'm here along, so I'm here along with some of my brilliant friends from Diva Staking. Has anyone given a round of applause from the stage before? No, let this be the first. I love cheering on my team. To give you a little bit of background um, on myself, I began my journey in crypto back in the beginning of 2020 when the entire world changed. I thought the term crypto bro was coined um, and commonly used for people who also had brothers in crypto working at the time who were forcing them to learn about blockchain technology. But I found out that everyone was just the crypto bro themselves. <laughs> The concept of staking, slashing, and tokens were introduced very lightly to me in the context of staking ETH and earning points, or mochi tokens, for making a report online to a bot each day to adopt a habit and complete a goal over the course of eight weeks. That concept was very simple. Stake ETH, make a report, earn tokens each day, that you successfully complete all of this, and you make that habit stickier. The token was also not live yet, so the real tagline was fake money, real friends. Um, and it was actually one of those incredible friends that led me to Diva in the beginning of 2023 last year, which looking back at it now was also towards the end of that bull run. This is also my third ETH Denver. Woo, so exciting. Um, and back then I was hosting a side event when I thought that these conferences were all just a competition for who could throw the best side event. And I continued to do that over the course of the next few years in different cities like Miami, uh, Bitcoin Miami, as well as DevCon Bogota, until I was introduced to Diva when they launched on Testnet at the beginning of last year. 
So today I want to share with you how powered by distributed validator technology, or DVT as you may have heard it, Diva offers the most decentralized and resilient staking solution for Ethereum liquid staking today. And it's important to remember at moments in time like this when we're, well, I think we're a little bit outside the bear market now. Let's call it the cautiously optimistic elephant market. It's important to remember that although new promising resilient solutions exist now with fun words like immutable smart contract and distributed, tech, distributed validator technology, there are still centralizing forces that threaten that future of Ethereum liquid staking. So what I would like to bring to attention today is a topic that's actually not new. But if the topic is, to new, is new to you today, good morning, wake up. Um, mentioned in the past by Shifai's Maggie Love with alarms recently sounded by Ethereum Foundation's Danny Ryan and actually Vitalik himself, the news is very clear. There is a present dire need for decentralization at the foundational level of liquid staking. And actually, decentralization is not only crucial for this future of Ethereum, it's inherent through its, to its ethos. So before we can more accurately address the needs of the network, we're going to take a look first at the risks that come with staking centralization, why it's crucial that we turn our eyes and our energy towards decentralizing now, and also how distributed validators or DBT, more specifically Diva's DBT, provides the current Optimus Prime solution for combating these risks and envisioning that building that brighter future for Ethereum. So as they say in Colorado, giddy up and let's get into it. So first, let me lay the landscape of current staking trends for you. There is no smoke hiding mirrors in the transparency of the blockchain, thankfully for us. Only the top three entities or exchanges currently control over 50% of the liquid staking network right now. That's Lido Finance, Coinbase, and Figment, as you can see up here on the screen. With over half of all of that staked ETH, um, according to this, Dune, this dashboard that we received from a Dune dashboard created by Hildavi, which, shout out, is actually a community member in Diva. So to put this into perspective, 26% of all ETH that's currently in supply is staked. Lido controls a third of that network with only 37 operators, 37. Um, and so while centralized exchanges retain full control over their validators, Lido relies on appointed entities. So I'm gonna go a little bit into that later on. Now, let's take a look at the proof of stake landscape in Ethereum specifically. First, I want to start off with solo stakers. Uh, shout out to the solo stakers out there, solo staker visibility if you are out there. Solo stakers are a little more than just as it sounds. It does include individuals who stake on their own, meeting the minimum requirements for Ethereum validation duties, but that does also include professional stakers or data center stakers. And then we have a subset of those solo stakers which are called home stakers. And they are, as you guessed it, Stake from validate and validate from home. Solo stakers run their own machines, sorry, um, like this one from our friends at DAP node, but hopefully the one on top is the near future with either a Diva sticker on that DAP node or our own, navid, our own native machines. Solo stakers run their own machines like this one, and it requires currently 32 ETH, which if you look at Ethereum today, that's over $106,000 to run your own. Yes, shocker, but actually it almost used to cost, it almost costed 1,000 ETH to run your own validator. So as I just mentioned, it requires running your own hardware, and on top of that, it also keeps your staked ETH locked. It is true if you have heard that solo staking currently poses this prime solution for staking since you're running your own validators and you're not relying on centralized pools. And you're also adding to the diversity of the ecosystem. But I'm sure that some immediate questions come to mind when you think about how there are individuals that really have enough 
technical background and the means to not run just one validator, but also multiple validators. So although there is this one side though, of rich getting richer, we do need to expand that thought with the perspective that it's actually these individuals that are clearly in it for the long run and for the longevity of Ethereum and not just the quick cash grab. So actually, these, pro these people probably also have a lot to share in terms of experience where they've seen uh, existing over the course of many cycles that we've seen up to this point today. Currently, solo stakers only make up a very tiny percentage, though, of all stakers. And that's only as far as we know or have access to, because we don't proper have a proper way of indexing solo stakers at the moment. So for being the most current optimal choice that's live on mainnet, that percentage is not nearly high enough. In addition to solo stakers, entities that you've probably heard more from and are more familiar with are staking with centralized exchanges. And what about it? <laughs> Unlike solo staking, there is no minimum ETH requirement to participate. However, these exchanges, um, with these exchanges, the staked ETH is not always liquid. So we see this in exchanges like Kraken and Coinbase, and they also, by the way, require a 10 to 25% fee. Centralized exchanges typically operate their own validators or nodes within the proof of stake blockchain network. And these validators are responsible for validating transactions, securing the network, and earning rewards for carrying out those validation duties. And users who stake their assets on these exchanges typically also receive a share of those rewards that are proportional to their contribution, of course. However, while staking centralization offers convenience and accessibility, it does come with certain trade-offs. Users have to relinquish their control of their assets to, to the exchange, which introduces counterparty risks. Additionally, the exchanges retain full control over the stake tokens, and they also may impose fees and other restrictions on the staking process. So here we, here we go with the final option at the moment, liquid staking. So liquid staking requires no minimum ETH. It also includes, includes DeFi protocols, and all staked ETH is liquid. So some examples that you might know are Lido, who I mentioned before, and also Rocket Pool. But they also do require a 10 to 14% fee, which is also better, but not amazing. So at the moment, more than 50% of the current Ethereum staking power is controlled by an alarming majority, as we've seen. Only the top three pools. Even further than that, 91% of these are permissioned or centralized themselves, leaving only 9%, I put us at the top though, for the decentralized options like us. In the current available and dominant solutions, trust in the node operators is also required. If you have a set of operators, as in many of the liquid staking protocols do, that assign liquid staking ether to operators who are running the validators, these operators have the ability to unilaterally create damage to Ethereum. They create losses and also transfer damage to the liquid staking token on top of that. There are risks that we cannot afford anymore when we leave overwhelming financial power unchecked. Centralization then in this way creates a bottleneck that stifles innovation and then also poses significant risks to the network's integrity, integrity overall. And this concentration of power is not just a theoretical risk that I'm talking about here today. It's a tangible threat that we've already seen the effects of. And by centralizing these staking power, we risk everything from single points of failure to potential censorship and manipulation of the network. So, for example, we have collusion and obviously also possible, other possible potential for attacks. So, in these staking solutions and their challenges, what we are seeing here is a common thread. And the common thread is, is this compromise that we cannot afford. The compromise between accessibility, control, and decentralization. This poses a dangerous trifecta that we might not have seen coming, and it might be too late when we give attention to it. In many staking models, trust in the node operators is actually just a given, but this trust comes with a price, the risk of unchecked power. History shows us time and time again that financial systems are vulnerable. In recent Actually, in 2022, so that was the, during the bear market, we have crypto research analyst Ryan Rasmussen at Bitwise 
And in this analysis, it was indicated that 46% of Ethereum's proof of stake nodes were controlled by just two addresses. He noted that this situation is clearly far from the decentralized ideal, and especially considering that a significant portion of those blocks, around 40% or more of those, have been built by two addresses belonging to who? Lido and Coinbase, with Coinbase obviously being that centralized service provider. Such dominance by this few entities in block production and node operation can be seen as actually antithetical to the principles of decentralization that underpin the Ethereum blockchain as a whole. And this is just one of many examples. We also have another. We also have um, an article here by Vitalik himself, where we are seeing the challenges and debates within the Ethereum community that are that are pertaining to the broader blockchain ecosystem regarding this balance between efficiency, decentralization, and then ultimately security. So. Finally, this brings us to distributed validator technology, which is a groundbreaking approach that reimagines the very fabric of staking. DBT distributes a validation process across an entirely decentralized network, ensuring that no single entity can dominate. So this isn't just an improvement, it's actually a paradigm shift towards a more transparent, transparent secure, and equitable Ethereum ecosystem. At the moment, DVT may seem like this golden egg from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, if anyone's seen that movie, where it seems like we have gained this egg and have the potential to win. We're like Harry sitting on the shoulders of our friends going, you want me to open it? And they're screaming, yeah. But then when he opens it, we just hear piercing screams because we have no idea what it's saying or what secrets it's holding. And then all of his friends end up dropping him. But spoiler alert, he actually just needed to take the egg underwater to hear its clues and secrets. So in terms of DVT, um, I'm going to open that egg underwater for you today. Sometimes you need the right environment and the right moment in time to digest something that's so new and somewhat scary. But I hope that environment is here at ETH Denver, and I hope that time is now. You can imagine DBT in way more simple terms um, as transforming a spotlight into a landscape of stars. Each point of light contributes to the overall illumination. The true benefits, however, come from the lowered risks of penalties that solo stakers, as I mentioned, as the current optimal option, currently face. Um, they face things due to, primarily due to technical issues, such as software bugs, hardware malfunction, or just power outages, all of which can send a node offline. But distributed validator technology obviously offers a wondrous solution where operator duties are split. But also, at Diva, we found that that's not all that it needs. It needs also to be combined with an economic model that benefits both stakers and operators as well. So DBT with Diva actually exemplifies the power of this technology. By democratizing the role of validators, Diva ensures that anyone can contribute and benefit to the Ethereum network. At Diva, we think everyone should be able to become an operator. There's no need for asking the DAO, no need to ask anyone, because without this, it's not a permissionless network and it's not a permissionless token. Without it, it's actually just a service that you're running with a set of operators providing this service through a smart contract. But economically, with DBT, when you have more people, you can take that 32 ETH that I just told you earlier that it takes to run a validator, and split that number into basically any number that you want. Actually, if you look at the people right now on the blockchain who have 32 ETH and the amount of people that have one ETH, there's actually 12 times more people. So with DVT, you open the door for more people to start staking and realize the blockchain principles. With others currently staking in pools like Rocket Pool and that are implementing these pools, they still require 8 ETH plus 2.4 ETH value in RPL tokens. So that's 10.4 ETH total. And expanding this access increases the potential to a large amount of way more operators in the network. Diva utilizes redundant clusters containing 16 nodes each. They are deterministically coordinating DKGs, which are distributed, which is distributed key generation, 
and they are randomly distributed, we have a two-thirds signing threshold and operating on a peer-to-peer -peer network. We actually haven't seen anything like this before that is production ready to go, that is for DKGs and peer-to-peer -peer where the machines are talking to each other and actually having conversations with each other. I'm going to stick on this one for a little bit. You can actually, of course, have multiple machines, many to distribute the load across many different entities. But most importantly with Diva, the collateral, who deposits and who controls those nodes is always the operator, not a centralized entity. So currently in Testnet, we have operators that can join the network by simply downloading or joining the Diva smart contract. Anyone can, anyone can operate uh, and by registering, registering a node and also join as a staker. So through this integrated technology, we can match them together. And to do that, Diva keeps track of all the operators that have been registered in Diva and all the nodes that have been registered in Diva. And those are the main entities that we have that are going to do the operation of the protocol. And of course, we also have the stakers. The stakers are also being tracked with the balances across dashboards and rewards, of course. But importantly, tracking here is to keep track of all the nodes because we need, to we need them later to create validators. This model reduces risk associated with centralization, fostering a more resilient and inclusive ecosystem. So taking a little bit of a closer look, the process begins by breaking down the validator's responsibilities into manageable and discrete tasks that are essentially fully automated. Validators, as a, full, a final reminder, are initiated every 32 ETH, and these tasks are then distributed among a diverse set of participants within the network. And then through advanced cryptographic techniques, such as those threshold, threshold signatures, as well as distributed key generation, in addition to collateral, which is also a, a crucial part of this pie as well, DVT ensures that no single participant has complete over control over the validator's actions. Without going too far into it, operators are essentially playing a lottery to run the DKG. And one of the unique things about Diva, as I mentioned before, is this piece of collateral. Even if you trust the operators in your protocol, they can still do anything. The randomness then additionally allows a uniform distribution of validators across the network of Diva instead of creating more centralization points. So not only is collateral needed to cover these poss possible damages to the operators, we actually also need these types of measures to prevent causing damage to the liquid staking token in turn. We actually need a, a system that's more complex, that's easy to adopt, and where nodes can concentrate and talk to each other and create that BLS key together. And we need something that also works fast. We need a system that key, where keys never come together, is resilient and also self-healing, and is secure and trust minimized. And so this setup significantly reduces the incentive to collude and ultimately reduces any single point of failure or attack, all while creating new opportunities. So as you can see here, Diva actually provides a fully integrated flow of stakers and operators. And staking acts as it does similar to other, other providers where anyone that has an Ethereum address can add their Ether into the Diva smart contract and join that validating process. So very quickly, let's take a look at how DVT stands firm up against some of the largest threats to centralization. Firstly, it democratizes the staking process, opening up opportunities for that broader participation and reducing the barriers to entry. Going multi-node offers uptime protection, increases, which increases by orders of magnitude. DVT actually additionally gives solo stakers the opportunity to, val to participate in validator clusters, which helps level the playing field against those larger entities. It also significantly enhances the security and resilience of the network by diversing its validator base. Oops. Not only does it make the network more resistant to attacks, but it also makes it more adaptable and more robust in the face of challenges because we welcome client diversity. So let me just go back here. Finally. Moving forward, instead of building a middleware on top of the consensus or execu execution clients, 
required to create a validator in traditional staking, Diva actually has created its very own native DVT that is much more simple to adopt. Imagine a world where everyone has a node and has a portion of their DeFi activity contributing to securing the network. The more participation, the more actively we are working towards that decentralization dream. And that's also not undermine the role of stakers in this picture. We need stakers who can stake their ether and technology in organizations that are more resi resilient overall. So our mission is clear, to steer Ethereum towards a future where decentralization is not just a principle, but a practice. With technologies like DVT and platforms like Diva, we're paving a way for the network that's more secure, accessible, and aligned with the ethos of decentralization. The future of Ethereum liquid staking lies in embracing this shift, in moving away from centralization and towards a more distributed, democratic, economic model that serves all instead of a tiny population. Finally, this path is not meant to be solitary. It's in order for the minority to stand a chance, we need to work together and it requires a collective effort. And all of us here in Denver and elsewhere that are continuing to build, we are actually emphasizing the limited potential for the downside and the unlimited potential for the upside. So let's go up together. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you're feeling very invigorated today. I'm going to be your MC for the rest of the afternoon. And I'm very excited to announce Chen Ching from Polyhedra. Let's give Chen Ching a little round of applause. Hello, hello? Yeah, come check. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tian Chen from Polyhedra Network and the co founder of CTO of Polyhedra. And it's very exciting here, uh, first day of the East Denver 2024. Um, I'm going to present some new advances in our company, and it's truly revolutionary. So, we will talk about zero knowledge proof systems and this from a verifier's perspective first. So imagine that we begin with a lonely verifier who has no information about what she's going to do. And one day, he come across with a prover, maybe malicious prover, on the internet. And the prover makes the following claim. There's no audio. Yeah, and there is no audio. It's supposed to be an uh, audio here. So I intentionally make it a Japanese sentence, and I know most of you don't know Japanese. It happens in the ZKP world. Uh, Wherever 
don't actually know what the prover is going to claim. And the prover is just saying random uh, trashes. For example, the prover claims that his circuit is a KCAC circuit, or the prover is claiming that his circuit is a SHA-256 circuit. But who knows? He may make false, false claims, right? And to verify these claims, the, the verifier needs need someone to help her. One way to solve the problem is you leverage a trusted third party that can help you to understand the claim. And here, in this example, we are using Google Translate, where you trust Google to translate this sentence for you. And yeah. And in the ZKP world, it's usually called a trusted setup, where you rely on a trusted third party to do some computation for you to identify the content of the circuit. Usually, it's the people use growth system or Plunk to do such task. However, such process require a lot of provers' resources, and it also introduces additional trust. The prover also need to do some very uh, computation extensive uh, computation like MSM or FFT. Well, another way is you the verifier do the work by herself. In this example, you learn the Japanese, then you obviously you can understand this sentence. But the the the, the this verifier will do a lot of work to understand the prover's circuit. He, she needs to at least scan the circuit where a circuit can be potentially very large. So the verifier computation in this uh, solution is very expensive. And there is another solution where we are going to introduce is based on a compiler. And look at these sentences. You can find that there is a pattern, actually, in these sentences, where you may notice that they begin all of all of them begin with the same prefix. And by leverage this kind of pattern, you can actually uh, make the very first computation easier. And in this case, you are going to are actually going to translate one sentence, and you're going to understand the rest. So let's dive into the technical details, where here is an example circuit of computing a very simple uh, computation. But if you compile the circuit, you will find that this, compu this compiled circuit, this RNCS compiled circuit, is actually very large. It's on the orders of 100 megabytes. But the source code is actually very small, very very short. And you may already notice that the source, the majority of the source code is doing this computation. It's just a simple multiplication where you can express it with several bytes instead of 100 megabytes. So the verifier, for, for the verifier to understand the circuit, she doesn't need to look at the circuit, the compiled circuit itself, where potentially it can be 100 megabytes. She can look at the source code, or in our term, it's the hint from the compiler, where a compiler will tell you that this circuit is just simply uh, repeat this sentence. So here, I'm going to announce our revolutionary compiler, where we don't have an off official name for it. I, I would tentatively call it log compiler because we are inspired from this term. It's called log space uniform circuit. And the circuit is actually, the log space uniform circuit is actually described this uh, property where the circuit can be generated from a very small program. And our compiler will initially support Gnux front-end language at, during the launch, and we will gradually expand our compilation 
to Planky, Halo, or Circle, or even more. And our plan for this open source is projected to be on May 2024, together with our prover. So it's not only the compiler, it's going to be an end-to-end -end prover tool chain. So the overall architecture of this compiler is the following. You take the programming language, it's described by a Go language, and you pass it to the circuit compiler, and the circuit compiler will output a circuit that has special structures, special substructures. And the, for the verifier to understand the circuit, it only needs to look at each individual sub-circuit uh, sub instead of look at the whole circuit itself. So the verifier can save the computation by orders of magnitude. And this new compiler potentially could enable a re recursive snark where because the verifier circuit is orders of magnitude smaller, so we can directly recurse on this verifier and make everything infinitely recursive. So oh, okay, let's talk about the prover part. We have the we we'll have also the state-of-the-art prover, where it's a GKR-based prover, and it can operate more than 3 million constraints per second on a single CPU, BN254. And here is the overall structure of the prover, where on, the, on this side, this side, the prover, this prover on the middle side is proof structure, and on, the, on this side is a verifier. So, the end-to-end -end experience is like, is like you write a circuit program, you execute it on our prover, and the finally you can verify this proof on the Ethereum chain. So that's okay. That's never done, that has never done before in this scale. We can verify billion-size circuit on chain. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, if you really want to look at our t documentation, you, you can look at the paper we, pre we presented. And it's called Libra and Pianist, two papers. And you can, if you look up my name, you can, you can search these papers. So, these are technical documentations we can provide right now. And after we open source the code, you can look at the code directly. Another nice property is we can infinitely horizontal scale where you can add a lot of machines without any overhead. And let's, let's, let me explain why other people cannot do this and why we can do this. So if we look, look at Fry protocol, the Fry protocol has a problem where it relies on the FFT, pro FFT but FFT itself has a problem of dis distributed computing, where in the middle of FFT, if you look at it, there is a linear size uh, communication between machines, where we, in our experiment, if you look at a sub-circuit of size 1 million, and if you look at 200 machines, they are going to communicate gigabyte of data if you use FFT or FRI. And this is not possible to decentralize. You can only place these machines in the same, I mean, in the same data center to achieve this distributed computing. We modify the fry. We actually replace the fry in our provers framework. We use the bivariate KDG introduced by our one of our previous paper. It's called Pianist. And this is very, I mean, this is te too technical to introduce here. You, maybe you can take a screenshot or take a photo. And so the nice property of this BioWare KDG is it replaces the FFT. Okay, if you, anyone wants to take a photo, just do that. So we replace the, the, the FFT using this new polynomial commitment scheme. And 
the nice property is due to the KDG, the nice property is we only require constant communication between different machines. And if you combine with the GKR protocol we in a prover, each node only need to send or receive in total 100 kilobytes of data, which you can, I mean, with 100 kilobytes of data trans communication, you can basically decentralize your prover globally. So let's talk about decentralization. Uh, we did an experiment on verifying 200, uh, sorry, 20, uh, 32k signatures, and the result is pretty uh, impressive. We only take five to six seconds to do that. And the hardware requirement is going to be 64 of these machines, handheld machines, globally distributed. And well, in the experiment, we don't globally distribute this, we just connect to the same Wi Fi. But we observe that the data transmission is very low, and we think it's possible to globally distribute these machines. So the hardware requirement will be very minimal, and it can potentially enable, uh, I mean, enable a new diagram where validators can purchase a very cheap machine and join the network to collaboratively do proving. Next is about a new proposal, actually not so new. We proposed it last year. And so it's all validators in one slot. Where in current Ethereum solution, we have almost 1 million validators. And due to the scalability of Ethereum, they cannot process 1 million validators in one slot. They have to divide it into 32 different slots where each slot has only uh, 30,000 validators. And this can cause problems because people need to wait for a lot of slots or blocks to get a finality to get a confirmed. In this simple example, you need to wait three slots to get your transaction confirmed. And in real, Ethereum, you need to wait for like 20 slots to get your transaction confirmed. The problem is they, the P2P network is get somehow get overloaded if you if you put more committee members into a P2P network, and we use our signature verification algorithm where you can batch the signature into a very small proof, and instead of sending all the public keys all the bit field in the, uh, I mean in, in the network you can send a small proof. So it can reduce the, P2, the, the burden on the P2P network. And finally, you can achieve a single slot finality. And that's all about this talk. Thanks so much. And this is our official website. There's no stuff here. <laughs>